Welcome to the Real View podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. We're so happy you're here to listen to us today. I am your host, Allison Wiley, and joining me is my co-host, Carrie R. Blaster, as well as our 2021 Ohio Realtors President, Seth Task. Thank you guys all for being here and joining me today. Absolutely. Hello. So Carrie's going to start us off today with our signature question. So we're, we're really excited about this. And uh, this is going to be our question that we're going to ask everyone that joins us on our podcast. So it should be interesting to hear our responses and we're looking forward to it. So Carrie, take it away. Yeah, that's right. So as you all know, this podcast is called The Real View. Um, and we're going to bring you lots of great, interesting perspectives on real estate here in Ohio. But today, Seth, we would like to know what is the best view that you've ever had? Well, and I haven't been a lot of places, by the way. I've been a lot of places in America. I haven't been very much around the world, but I would say this. I have two favorite views. One will be sort of ceremonial for me and and the other is geographical. I would have to say that the moment I stood in front of the Grand Canyon and saw the Grand Canyon, I was literally blown away. If you ever seen the movie Vacation, where they stood and, you know, he put his arm around. He's like, okay. And then he walks away. He's like, okay, we got to go because he stole the money. I stood there in that spot when I was 13 or 14 years old. And uh, I would say that that was an awe-inspiring vision. And then the second is, you know, some of you may know, some people know I was the Browns mascot in the early 90s, early to (laughs) mid 90s. And so standing on the field of Cleveland Stadium, And I had one time, it took me a while, I started a wave myself. It took a half an hour to do. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I was in a dog suit. I was a a dog and and it took me a while (laughs) to to get, you got to get the dog pound to commit because that's the only one section. This is the old stadium. It was the only one section, right? There's (laughs) tears. So I had to get like eight sections to commit. And then I had to get the whole dog pound to commit. And then you got two sections. And so it took me a while, but I finally got everyone to, and I, and as the wave finally happened, this was in the middle of a game, I literally ran the entire field. It was, you know, like a, I mean, around a football field in a dog suit. And I ran it around as the whole wave ran and I came down and I spun around and I fell down on my back and I watched it go around like five times. And that was amazing. That is awesome. That is so cool. So those are my two problem, my two greatest views. I love it. And, you know, as we're recording this, it is the Monday after a huge Browns victory over the Tennessee Titans yesterday. So very accurate that this is coming up today. I love it. All right. Uh, All right. Enough, enough. (laughs) There's a great rivalry in the office, Seth. You'll appreciate this. Some of us are Southwest Ohio people. So we are Bengals fans and lamenting our season. But for those of you in Cleveland, congrats. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry about the loss of your quarterback there. Yes, hopefully by the time this podcast is airing, uh, we will be talking about the playoff Browns. Nope, no Steeler fans. Yeah, thank goodness. Well, I thought that was a that was a great answer to that question, Seth, so thank you. And uh, this is why I think this question is going to be so fun to ask because the stuff we're going to be able to figure out from people I think is going to be really cool. And everyone's going to have a different answer to this question. So I'm really excited about hearing more answers as we get more guests on our podcast. So Thanks, Carrie, uh, for asking that. Seth, if you just want to uh, introduce yourself to us and, and to our members and consumers that are listening out there, uh, tell us who you are. Tell us how you got started in real estate, how you got started with Ohio Realtors. Let us know a little bit about you. Sure. So how did I get involved in Ohio? You know, I sort of, I went sort of backwards. Ohio was my last, you know, partner of the three-way agreement that I got involved in. When I first got, I got licensed in 05. I didn't do a lot my first year. I was in the restaurant business, my prior career. A lot of us have a prior career, unless you're, unless you're born in real estate. I was in restaurants. 
And then uh, once I got into real estate, I still was finishing a restaurant and then I went full time in end of 06. And so during that process of getting involved, I started building a team. I was listing a lot of properties and I lived in Aurora at the time, which is in Portage County. We had two different MLSs. My office was in Cuyahoga County. My office was in Portage County. I didn't understand these different MLSs at the time. I didn't even know what an MLS was. I probably couldn't even tell you what it meant. But I did know that I listed a property in one county and other people couldn't see my listing and they were explaining to me why I needed to be on this other MLS. And so I paid the money, I got in this other MLS and all of a sudden my listings are showing up on realtor.com twice. And you know I'm made to look like an idiot at this point, I'm thinking. And so I tried to figure this all out. Why is this happening? And and so I went and talked to the two MLSs and the board president and the and the CEO at, at the old KBOR and it sort of got to the bottom of the fact that these two MLSs could share data together. Like there was a solution to why this could be fixed, but it was a very political situation between these boards and MLSs. And one thing I said to all these players after I figured out that we could fix this was that I said, well, I said, it's very political. I said, well, it's one something I know about politics. I said, there's, there's power in numbers in politics. And so I'm going to email about a thousand agents a day until you guys figure this out, because nobody's going to make me look stupid to my clients. And so I started doing that. I started downloading all these email addresses and sending out all these emails that MLSs and the board had sent me. And it turned into the board presidents thinking, we need this guy at the board to lead because he doesn't have a problem saying stuff, right? That's how you tap people on the shoulder. So Diana Hostastickney at the time tapped me on the shoulder and said, there's this thing that NAR has uh, said we have to do, this thing called YPN, and I, I need you to chair it. And I had not done anything at the board at this point. Um, she did this to me, asked and she did this to me at uh, the Christmas party. I went to the Christmas party. I was at a holiday party. I'm like, well, I might as well go to the holiday party. I'm a realtor. Here's a holiday party. There were like 38 realtors there. It was a board of thousands of people. There were only 38 realtors there. So that's how popular k was at the time or unpopular. And so she appointed me to YPN. I was a YPN chair of this regional YPN. And the next year, we started doing all these events. It was the first time in years people were coming to events that the board was putting on. So it was really exciting. It was an exciting time. We had an advisory group of 20 people. Joe Dirks, one of those people who's very involved right now. Sarah Kalo was sort of our, she was trying to keep us in line, you know, during those meetings. Because, you know, we had, we weren't a standing committee. So I walked in the first meeting. I said, I don't have time for this stuff. I didn't say it that way, but so this is going to be a benevolent dictatorship and uh, we're just going to make stuff happen. And so we did. And uh, a year later, Ron Phipps, who was the incoming president of Ohio Realtor or NAR, excuse me, said, we need YPNers involved at the national level. We need young people. I wasn't, I was 40, you know, I wasn't young, but I was, I was on that YPN threshold. I was just there. And, uh, and so he said, we need young people. Hey, that's young, Seth. I that, beg to differ. Right, yes. Yes, I understand. Well, listen, <laughs> hey, it, it was, yes, it's young. For, young. It's re- young for realtors, <laughs> yes. And so they, uh, Mike Valerino <laughs> called me, you know, from KBOR at the time. He said, you're the YPN chair, and they're inviting YPN chairs from around the country to go to leadership in Chicago. And so I said, okay, they're paying for me to go. So I went. And really, honestly, my eyes were opened to the world of what realtors do. I wish everybody could see that. I think now that that like we've got this virtual thing going all around the country, I think people might see it. But there's, it's really impactful when you stand in a room. The first day, we just met a bunch of YPNers. We were having drinks. We were having a great time. I mean, people like you know Brian Copeland and Michael Oppler, whose dad is NAR president right now, and uh, Matt Phipps, who's Dad was NAR president-elect at that time. And I mean, so many people who, Nate Johnson, who's a liaison this year, and Tamar Siminski. I mean, I can't even tell you how many amazing people around the country. And we all became friends for life. And so we were, you know, doing our thing. Ron Phipps comes into our first meeting and says, we need young people on national committees. Fill this form out. Now, those people who have applied for national committees, you got to fill out the expertise profile. 
you got to talk about all these things you've done. It's a huge thing, right? You got to go through. I didn't have to do that. I filled out a piece of paper that literally said name, board, one, two, three. List three committees. That's That was the piece of paper. I mean, it was photocopied. It wasn't even a good photocopy. It was just to fill out this piece of paper. And so I put, I didn't even know what committees there were. I just read this list of committees. I said, federal financing and housing policy. Oh, that sounds hot. I'm like, that sounds great. So that and conventional financing and federal taxation. I'm like, yeah, I love this stuff. I wanted to be president of the United States, by the way, coming out of high school. You guys probably don't know that, but that was my path. I was going to be president. So I was one of those geeks. And now you're president of the realtors. <laughs> well, that's better because, see, I'm not going to go through an election like that. So so anyway, so I got a letter later in the year that said, congratulations, you're on the Federal Financing Housing Policy Committee of the National Association of Realtors. I called Mike Valerino. I said, Mike, I got this letter. He's like, what? How'd you do that? I'm like, I don't know. I just filled out a piece of paper when I went to Chicago. And uh, he's like, oh, my gosh, you got to do stuff in Ohio now. I'm like, all right. And he's like, I'm going to take care. I'm going to sign you up for some Ohio stuff. I'm like, OK, I get this list of five committees he puts me on in Ohio. I'm a director. I'm all these things. And I'm like, Mike, two of these meet at the same time. He's like, don't worry about it. So this one's a forum. It's just a... <laughs> You just pop your head in. I'm like, all right. right." But I will say this. My eyes were opened at that meeting in leadership. Yeah, Yeah, right. At leadership in Chicago. I was like, wow, this is huge. You know, here's 1,200 people. Everyone here represents hundreds, if not thousands of people. And And then you're multiplying in your head. You're like, and then when I came back and I was at my very first Ohio director's meeting, I remember I was sitting in the back right of the room. This was at Easton. You know, they were doing the RPAC Awards and life, you know, I'm a sucker for Lifetime Achievement Awards like the Cecil B. DeMille and all those. I'm always, you know, a waterfall. But I'm just watching all this stuff. And, you know, I'm amongst friends this time that I know. And I remember thinking to myself for the first time in my life, this is where I belong. This is my path. And that was at an Ohio Realtors, my very first Ohio Realtors directors meeting. So. Here I am. Wow. That's powerful. And it clearly puts you on the path to eventually become president, which is, which is amazing. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-licensed course locations. I want to spend some time in this next section of the podcast talking a little bit about the initiatives that you've set forth for 2021. I don't know if we necessarily have time to cover all of them. You've got three, diversity, outreach, and sustainability. I wanted to start first with diversity. It's been a difficult year for a lot of reasons, but I think at the end of this year, we've had to have some conversations that are important and necessary, not only for us as communities, but also for our industry. And I see that you have, you know, taken that and put it into the work that you want to do next year at Ohio Realtors. So I just want to open it up to you and and hear from you about what is it that you're hoping to accomplish with this specific goal of diversity? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, listen, anybody who knows me or knows my past or what have you knows that diversity would have been my number one two and three, regardless of what happened this year. I always like to say, you know, I'm just a Jewish kid from Cleveland. You know, as somebody who is, you know, somewhat in, we're all in a protected class, right? Everyone's in a protected class. People say, well, I'm not in a protected class. Everyone is to some degree, right? I mean, if you look at all the protected classes, you have some nationality or ancestry, right? Somebody, So you're from somewhere or your ancestry is from somewhere. So because America's only been here for, you know, 200 some years, right? So 
everyone's in a protected class. So don't forget that. I think it's important to know that. But I will tell you that um, it's great that America is being forced into, you know, this conversation. And it's a shame that we're forced into this conversation. But we are in this conversation and it's long overdue. One thing that I, I just couldn't understand as my leadership path has gone on, I couldn't understand why, I mean, just to throw things out there, and I say it the way it is. So I couldn't understand why we, there weren't some enough African-Americans, you know, in leadership at whether it's a local board or at the state level or even the national mm -hmm. level. So I got involved and became a member of the Realtists and started having conversations with a lot of my friends there. And we're bringing a lot of them along now. But you know, there was a lot of things that just didn't happen. And as somebody whose people have been persecuted, you know, for generations, you know, I sort of understand that when I walk down the street, you don't know I'm Jewish. So that's different than, you know, than a black person, you know, they can't hide, you know, what they are. But, you know, the reality is, is that we contributed for decades to, you know, so many problems in relation to fair housing. And I was very proud of Charlie Opler for finally, as, as a representative of the National Association of Realtors, for finally apologizing for our role as realtors in, um, you know, honestly, in the horrific actions that were taken decades ago. And listen, it takes generations sometimes to get over hurt. Yeah. And Seth, just for listeners who may not know that history, you know, there was a time when the National Association of Realtors and Realtors across the country were opposed to some of the fair housing changes that we now support. Is that correct? That's what you're you're referencing, just for those who may not know. It was in the code of ethics of the National Association of Realtors that you could not sell a property to somebody who would devalue the property, the neighborhood. I mean, that was that's an opinion, number one. But number two, you literally couldn't, it was, you know, steering was the code. I mean, redlining was the code. I mean, yeah. so it was horrible. And frankly speaking, you know, even to this day, home ownership amongst blacks in America is about 15% lower than that of whites. It's cultural. It's got to change. It takes all of us to do it. And that's part of our agenda for yeah. 2021 is for Ohio Realtors to, to participate in that. And also to have our, our leadership represent our membership. So a strategic way to, to get our members to tap people on the shoulder that are not involved in leadership now at Ohio. And Seth, I know coming into 2021, you've already had a success, if you will, in the partnership that we've created with the LGBTQ plus alliance. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, I know their incoming, their president for 2021 is also from the Cleveland area, which is a huge badge of honor, I think, for all Ohio realtors, you know, but if you just want to talk a little bit about that um, and what you've already accomplished coming into 2021. Well, first off, let me say that that accomplishment is Alex's and the LGBTQ plus community and not mine. I mean, it's all of ours, but listen, Alex Cruz who is the national vice president of the LGBTQ plus real estate alliance, which is obviously an advocacy group for that community in real estate. You know, there was a shakeup in Nagel Rep. Just to give a little history, there was a shakeup in the in the leadership in Nagel Rep. I'm not going to get into that, but it, it created an exodus, you know, as it were, for many local chapter founders and presidents of that organization to found a new organization. And they did, and it's growing very quickly. Um, that's the LGBTQ plus real estate alliance. They call themselves the alliance for short. You know, it's listen, you know, yet another group that is discriminated. They absolutely need to exist. It's extremely important. Alex isn't just a Clevelander and you guys on this. He's on my team. He's on my real estate team. And I will tell you that there's, you know, there's nothing more important for a realtor than having a business plan. Starting with that, right? We're business owners. We're independent contractors. We don't have a salary. You know, I know some do, but if you're a selling agent, you don't have a salary. It's what you sell. And so it's always been my hope for my agents on my team and at my brokerage to have a goal and to have a business plan and for part of that business plan to be a give back. You know, we're community based profession. And so, um, you know, one of the things that Alex wanted to do at the very five years ago was to be an advocate for the LGBTQ community 
in Cleveland and in real estate. And so it started out with him just with a Cleveland, you know, the sort of the Cleveland young professionals of that organization, non-real estate, just Cleveland young professional LGBTQ, turned into him being involved in Nagel Rep. Cleveland did not have a Nagel Rep chapter. He founded it. He started doing events. ACAR, the Akron Cleveland Association of Realtors, started helping out with that. And then, you know, once that shakeup happened with that association, he became one of the national leaders in what was going on with the change, primarily because he created an education course, a CE course, that we are actually, and I don't know if this is going to air before or after the Winter Conference, I'm guessing before, but he is teaching his course at the Ohio Realtors Winter Conference, Virtual Winter Conference. It's an amazing, amazing course that if you have never, you know, taken and understood that community, you got to take this course. I mean, it's so important to understand the mindset of really every one of our, you know, protected classes and, you know, how to prevent really, you know, discrimination. Sometimes you don't even know, right? Sometimes you just don't know what offends somebody because you don't know. You don't know this word or that word is offensive to a community. So anyway, so he's now the national vice president of that association. I could not be more proud of him and he's earned every bit of it. Well, that's awesome. And and it's so exciting. It's so important. You know, I think our association is going to be in great hands with you leading the way in 2021, especially on this timely and so important topic of diversity. So I know we're running a little close on time. So I thought it would be great to wrap up with, you know, any final words from you, Seth, and also what does real estate mean to you? I mean, you can hear it when you talk in your voice, how passionate you are. And and now uh, you can see it in your actions with your involvement at the NAR level and now as our president. But what does real estate mean to you? How has it impacted you? And, um, you know, any last words you, you want to share with our with our listeners? Sure. You know, I say it uh, like this and I can't, oh God, somebody just recently said it on a Zoom somewhere and I've been saying it for a long time that before it was life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, it was life, liberty and property. That was the first original draft, life, liberty and property. This country was founded on being able to own your own property. You know, I mean, so people came, my family came from the Ukraine, most of them in the late 1800s. I mean, I don't know where your families are from, but they're from somewhere else. And most people came here to be free and to own their own land. You know, one of my favorite movies is Far and Away. If you ever watched that one about the Oklahoma land race, like I'm crying at the end, they plant the flag, you know. I mean, you know, there's property is so important. Being able to own your own property, it builds wealth. It's a wealth building tool. There's nothing like the pride of ownership handing the keys to a first time home buyer. It's just something else. And so our country is built on that. People, people left their families thousands of miles to cross oceans and risk their lives in ships that who knows if they were going to make it here. Who knows how many sunk in the, in the ocean? You know, I just believe in America. And that's really the basis of America is, you know, is our ability to own property. And we have to protect that. And when I realized that the realtor associations was really the advocacy of what we do is sort of the foundation of protecting that. I think that really was the thing that hooked me, right? Was that this is it right here. Not only not only can I sell real estate and help people achieve their dream, whether it's home ownership or investment or what have you, but I can also protect the American dream. I don't have to be president of the United States to do that, right? So I'm doing it here and I'm going to keep doing it here in Ohio and You know, I'm going to keep doing what I do at uh, NAR and uh, I enjoy every bit of it. And I'm going to I'm going to ask other people to do the same. And if they don't want to invest their time, then I'm going to get their money through uh, RPAC and they can contribute that way. That's okay. I'm rambling, but that's what I do. So I I, I think that's it. I just love it. I love this business. It's amazing. And. Well, you can tell, uh, Seth, in just our short conversation with you today. So 2021 is going to be an amazing year. It has to be. I'm declaring it now after everything we went through in 2020. But I really do think it's going to be an amazing year for you as our leader, as well as Ohio Realtors and all of the great things that we're going to get accomplished this year. So Seth, thank you so much for joining us today. Carrie, thank you for joining me as your co-host. I've loved spending time talking to you guys today. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to an awesome 2021 with you, Seth. 
Yes, it's going to be awesome. And uh, we're going to have a great time. We're going to do some virtual. We're going to do some in person later on this year because everyone's going to have a vaccine sometime this year. So I'm excited that, that we're going to have a convention in September in person. And it's going to be a party. I'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty spectacular. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time. This has been a Humble Pod production. Stay humble.